You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. And I'm Tiffany Manor. Hey, we have three hosts in studio today. <laughs> this is just, on. we're like, there's a cosmic shift today. This Everyone wants fun. to talk mental health. Well, it's, it's, it's yeah. Mental Health Monday. And Tiffany was so gracious, jumped in when Sarah was out and jumped in on the series. And I said, hey, if you want to stick around for the rest of the series, it's going to be great conversations. And I said, absolutely. I want to be there, particularly since we've got such a great guest. Yes. We are talking with Dr. Saunders, continuing our series on uh, Martin Luther and mental health. Great resource. And so we're going to continue the conversations today with Dr. Saunders. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, Dr. Stephen Saunders. He is the PH, uh, he is the Schneider Endowed Distinguished Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychology at Marquette University. Dr. Saunders, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here again. We are, I'm learning a lot in the series. I think, I know, Tiffany, you, you shared that you've been learning a lot and enjoying mm-hmm. the conversation as well. Sarah, welcome back to the series. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to talking about mental health today. Dr. Saunders, a, a little disclaimer as well. Dr. Saunders is a professional clinical psychologist and very pleased to offer ideas and suggestions about mental health and mental health problems over the course of this series. It's important, though, to recognize one very important piece of advice that Dr. Saunders frequently gives is to get professional help when you need it. So anything we share in the program today is not to be taken as therapy or treatment or a substitute for personal consultation with a professional. So now it's time to dig into our conversation about mental health. And today we're going to start off with stigma. Mm -hmm. What has led to stigma, in your opinion, stigma and shame surrounding mental health problems and mental illness, Dr. Saunders? Well, that's such a great question. It's actually a question that's consumed much of my professional career, meaning I teach about it a lot, a lot and I, I've i done some research into it. I've read, if you do research in something, you read a lot about it. And it's a, it's a fascinating question. Stigma, you know, stigma literally means a sign. You know, stigma comes from the, I think it's Latin, it might be Greek, stigmata, which is, you know, the, the saints used to have, the, you know, they would bleed from their palms or from their from their feet, you know, as a sign, a a stigma that they believe so heartily, so, so strongly in Christ, they actually experienced his suffering and they, they, it showed through these signs, again, the stigmata. So stigma is kind of a sign that sets someone apart. And now we use it as a way to indicate that people have generally negative yeah, and then not everyone, but people can have negative beliefs, thoughts about someone or something or about mental illness. In this case, they have negative or, or thoughts about mental illness or persons who experience mental health problems. And those thoughts, the big theme of the book, which is based on Martin Luther's writing, but also based on, you know, what, what minor mental health professionals teach and try to help people with. A big part of the book is how we think determines how we feel. If we have negative thoughts about mental illness, that will lead to negative feelings. If I think, if someone thinks, you know, persons with mental illness are weak or they're dangerous, well, they're weak, then I'm going to feel, you know, I'm going to feel, I'm going to pity them for being so weak that they became mentally ill. Or if they're dangerous, I think that person has a mental illness, mental illness is dangerous. I'm going to be fearful. That thought's going to lead to the feeling of fear. So we definitely have this stigma about mental illness, mental health problems, but it's curious as to, as to where it comes from, because, you know, one in five persons in any given year has a mental illness, even more, as we talked, you know, talking over the weeks, even more people have sort of, you know, not, not severe enough to be diagnosable mental illness, but, but more like a mental health problem, you know, so, you know, another what, 20, 30% of people at some time feel just sort of sad or, or down or anxious. And yet, you know, and yet we have this, I'm, you know, I don't know, what do you guys think, Andy, Sarah, Tiffany about, you know, where do, where do you think, you know, stigma towards, because, because it's all around us. We, we breathe this. We experience this all the time in our society. I'm curious as to what you guys think about. Yeah, I think 
I think for one thing, it's an invisible illness. And I think invisible illnesses tend to have a lot more mystery around them. I think they can scare us a lot more because they're not on the surface. Like if I break my arm, I go to a doctor and they know exactly what to do about it. But if my and brain... can see your broken arm. Right. And everyone can see it. And they're like, oh, you have a broken arm. You'll heal in a little while. No big deal. But like if my yeah. brain feels sick, like I have to acknowledge that to myself. I, other, I have to actually tell other people that something is wrong. And that's scary, just admitting that something's mm-hmm. actually wrong with you. And then it's it can be difficult. You know, is there an actual prescribed treatment plan how do we even figure out why my brain feels sick like there's just there, i feel like there's a lot of a lot more layers to yeah. mental health issues that can be it just it feels a lot more complicated and it feels like it could be a lot more scary to admit and to talk about with other people right and just the the the, the invisibleness i think that's a, that's a great observation great insight because if you go to church and you have your arm in a sling and what happened I broke my arm. What's the next question? How did you break it? Mm. Well, I, I, I fell off my sled or skiing or, you know, I was something. Putting on socks. <laughs> yeah, putting on socks. <laughs> right. right. Makes. You re- reach a certain age, you know, that's because you're getting old. So, you know, we don't need an explanation, but, it, but it's easy. It's easy to see, you know, but, and, but we often want to know, and it's hard to sometimes know where do, where do mental illnesses come from? I think another part of it is just our interaction with people. Uh, Mental health issues can affect how we interact with other people. And sometimes that can be something that's looked down on if all of a sudden you're not acting in a way that people expect you to to behave. Or, you know, if I'm if I'm feeling depressed and so I, I I maybe don't come off as a happy person to people and other people just don't know what to do with that or they're not trained to know what to do with somebody who is experiencing Things that we you know, are um, are acting in, in ways that we feel are are like less than ideal, quote unquote. You know that that can mm-hmm. create you know uh, interpersonal issues too, just because we don't we don't necessarily know how to deal with that when other people are right. acting in some ways. And I think to to add on to what Sarah's saying and, and the idea of expectations, and even to go back through the generations and how some of these expectations are are, are handed from generation to generation, and, and even going you know way back in, in the church. Um, for Christians in particular, we've not always handled mental health problems, mental illness in ways that encourage people to speak up. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, I like to refer to it as like a, a, a clumsy attempt. I mean, if, to do to do good. My my doctoral research was in suicide prevention, specifically within the Christian Church. And as you look back, yeah, you know, this is I mean, pre Martin Luther. Theologians were saying that people who died by suicide could not be buried within the church cemeteries and, and graveyards. And really what they were trying to do is is not shame anyone. Well, I, I guess in some ways they they were. It was but they were trying to prevent what we now call things like social contagion. Like they, they didn't want anyone else to take their lives. And so they were trying to in, in ways that were you know created stigma and shame instead. Mm-hmm. So you know that's that's certainly been something that's been going on for a, a lot of of years and it it's you know it encourages people to hold things to themselves they feel like they can't share what they're feeling mm-hmm. is it i i don't know tiffany was my guess is that this might be wrong but it's the case that martin luther has said explicitly it is not my opinion that all suicides go to hell um so he, he basically completely I don't know if he was the first to the first Christian, the so to speak, to to, to actually reject that very Catholic notion that a suicide they are in hell. They violated uh, the commandment not to kill. Only God can take a life. They they defied God. Therefore, they're in hell. Therefore, they can't should not be buried in a Christian cemetery. But Luther said, nah, not necessarily. Right? Is that correct Is from your yeah. research? Yeah, absolutely. He, and he wasn't the first, but, you know, he it was an icon. And as you've said in, in your book, he has such profound wisdom and was ahead of his time. And he was influential. But even so, even with Martin Luther saying that, that still didn't completely break that cycle of, of stigma and shame associated around depression. And that's what he was really talking about there. So, yeah, the church has not made that condemnation for people who died by suicide, were depressed, or mentally ill. 
but somehow there's been confused thinking and that's you know really contributed to the stigma and the shame within the church that was depicted in a Luther film in the early 2000s, too. I don't mm. know if you remember that scene. And I'm, I, I'm assuming it's historically, I mean, it, it's a it's a characterization probably of Luther uh, addressing a family who had experienced a suicide and, and responding with what you had just said, Dr. Saunders, that that he, I think the, the character in that film describes the, the person who had experienced suicide, liking it to someone who had been robbed by thieves in the wood. Yeah. You know, that that they had been robbed of something, that they had been robbed of the, you know, the joy of life, that something had been, their their mental health had been taken from this, essentially, mm-hmm. I think was what he was likening it to. I thought that was an interesting character, characterization, of, <laughs> that's a hard word to say, um, of Luther and his understanding of, of mental health as well, I think. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I obviously didn't use those words necessarily, but... His understanding, and we'll get to more of Luther's understanding of mental health as we continue this conversation. <laughs> and we're going to continue the conversation. It's time for a break already. So we'll continue the conversation on mental health here in just a moment. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Eddie Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Tiffany Manor. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Tiffany Manor. Having all three of us in studio today talking with Dr. Stephen Saunders, a professor of psychology in at uh, Marquette University, and our guest this in the series, Martin Luther on Mental Health, Practical Advice for Christians Today, a great book from Concordia Publishing House. So we, we've talked a little bit about stigma and... I don't know if we've really narrowed, nailed down where stigma comes from, but it's certainly a very real issue that we face and that it's been passed on to us from generation to generation. So in responding to that stigma, what's an appropriate way for us as Lutherans to understand mental illness and mental health problems, considering stigma sometimes frames mental illness and mental health problems as weakness or other, I don't know, unhelpful depictions of mental health and mental illness. What's an appropriate way for us as Lutherans to understand mental health problems and mental illness? I sort of summarize the stigma towards mental illness as weakness, badness. They're either weak or they're bad or some combination. Bad covers, you know, dangerous, unpredictable. I mean, someone who is dangerous and unpredictable, you really should be afraid of. You know, so the, you know, stigma, I think what what Dr. Manor was saying is absolutely true that partly we have stigma towards mental illness because we were encouraged by some of the Catholic teachings, Christian teachings, even the teachings of some psychologists that, you know, that there's something, you know, that, 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 that is absolutely wrong to, you know, feel depressed or so depressed that you think about suicide you know, one of the things I teach students is how do you ask about suicide when you're meeting with the client, a patient, they're depressed, you need to ask them about suicide. And so how do you ask? What's a gentle way to ask, an effective way to ask? And the, the, the way to not ask is, oh, you're not going to kill yourself, are you? Or you're not, you're not doing something stupid like thinking about suicide, are you? Instead, we say, you know, a lot of people, when they feel this badly, they think about hurting themselves. So there's, but, but, but that's, it's almost natural for people, not natural perhaps, but it's, we've been taught our society very much has this odd, this unhelpful stigmatizing attitude towards mental health problems. And Sarah said, it's, yeah, I think it's a lot that it's an invisible, unless someone tells you that they are depressed or anxious, you won't know. In fact, that's one of the things that Christians ought to do is just be observant. If someone looks like they're sad, looks like, you know, they're, they're, they're hugging the wall, they're, 
you know, they, they, they look like they're lonely, approach them, ask them how they're doing, introduce yourself. Um, you know, that it, be, because, you know, if your sense is that there's something going on, approach the person and, and say, say, how, Hey, I'm, I'm Steve. How are you? What's your name? Are you new to this church? And, you know, just get to know them, be, be friendly towards them. That's, that's such an important thing. You know, the other way that we know someone is mentally ill is if they do something kind of outrageous, you know, there are some mental illnesses, but not many. So actually it's the rare mental illness, so to speak. It's, it's, you know, there are some serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. You know, there are, there are adults and children with autism spectrum disorder that are disruptive. And so sometimes it's obvious. So this, there's something going on with this person, but you know, most persons who are suffering with mental illness, they're depressed, they're anxious, and they're able to, just like Sarah said, they're able to keep it to themselves. And unless they tell you, you will not know. So in answer to your question, Andy, what do we do? Well, let's not wait for them to tell us. Let's actually reach out and encourage them to tell us. I encourage pastors. I encourage teachers to talk about mental illness. Basically to say from the pulpit after church, we can put things in our bulletins. You know, this month we're collecting money for Lutheran social services or leave it in there. You know, part of our donations, part of our, part of contributions will be given to this clinic that we're, that, that we support this mental health clinic. Send the message, in other words, and we, you know, the formal term for this is outreach, where we reach out to someone as opposed to making them reach out to us. We reach out to those in front of us and we say, we don't know who you are, but we know you're there. We know that one in five persons here is experiencing depression, anxiety, something more serious than that. And gosh, we are sure glad you're here. And would love to talk to you about it. Um, it, it you know, I don't know if, if, if you guys are familiar with other outreach strategies that churches might take or, you know, that the Christian congregation might take. I sometimes talk about it as initiating the care. So it's not waiting for someone to come to you, but you, as you were describing, reach out to them. And so in our congregations and our families and our workplaces and in schools, it's, it's the noticing, it's being attentive and asking someone, is everything going okay with you? How are you feeling lately? And not just the, how are you doing? Where there's the, you know, the rote reply, but spending some time with them and, and really finding out how they're doing. So, you know, in our congregations, it's noticing who's not been in church for a while. And it's not that you say when you see them, oh, you know, hi, introduce yourself. I don't know who you are in a joking kind of way, but really caring for someone is finding out what's going on in your life that I haven't seen you. And then listening as you were describing, encouraging them to talk. But someone who's experiencing mental health problems, mental health um, illness may not have the energy to to come um, approach you and to reach out to you. So we've got to reach them just as you were describing. Okay, so that works for extroverts. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I'm an introvert. I do it. So I, am, I have to kind of challenge. <laughs> it, it works for extroverts, but introverts can, you know, they can rise above their desire to, you know, be recharged. See, introverts, I th this is my personal opinion. Introverts are very good at noticing things about people, though, because we live in our, we live in our heads so much that, that I think we tend to like notice people in a way that extroverts may not. And so using your introvert superpowers <laughs> yes, and noticing but something. I can live in those thoughts, but taking that step of actually uh, You can do hard someone. things, Andy. Yeah, I, I get it though. I, I understand why. It is scary. Is. Yeah. Because Are they going to think I'm weird because I'm Maybe. introducing myself? But in a couple of months when you actually know somebody and are in relationship with them, you'll yeah. laugh about how weird it was when you <laughs> up to them and said something. <laughs> I mean, it's come up in, in our Lutheran Ladies Lounge uh, Facebook group several times that people are like, nobody in my congregation cares about me. And like, that breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I also recognize that like, oh, I haven't actually been reaching out to people when I probably should. And so that was convicting to me that, yes, it's scary as an introvert to like say something additional. But 
maybe before you go to church, you you think through it of like, I've noticed that this person maybe hasn't been chatty as much as they usually are. So I, after church, I will approach them. This is what I'm going to say. And then I'm just going to run with it. And if they think I'm weird, fine, I'll walk away. But I'll own it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. right. Yeah. Like be comfortable being a little uncomfortable in order to actually build. Because I, I, what I hear everyone saying is that this comes in relationship. Like we need to be in relationship with people and for them to know that we actually care about them and aren't just like approaching them flippantly. Like we actually care enough to talk to them and to build a relationship and to show up for them in a way that maybe other people aren't. Yeah, I, I would bet everyone in the room here has certain phrases that they use that they've memorized, so to speak. One of mine is I'll go up to someone and says, I know we've met, but I forgot your name. Yes. You know, and chances are 80% that they forgot my name also. So, my, you know, I don't, I don't know anyone. Everyone I know says, I'm so bad with names. Turns out we're all bad with names. So just, remember, you know, here, here's a phrase, you know. I, I, I know we've met, I've at least seen you, but I've forgotten your name. I'm Steve, you know, and I'll give them my name and shake their hand and nice to see you again. And how are things going? Here's another, you know, sort of a thing about, you know, reaching out to someone, asking how they're doing as, as, you know, as was suggested, you know, sometimes we just can anticipate that someone isn't doing so well. You know, their their daughter just went through a divorce or a grandchild is in the hospital or, you know, they just lost a parent or they, you know, and these are not things that necessarily lead to mental illness, but certainly lead to emotional distress. And so we go up to them and say, how are things going? Knowing that they they recently lost their mom. You know, how are things going? And it, that will lead to just, well, first of all, it's so comforting to the other person that that you care about how they're doing emotionally. It's so comforting to for them to know that you remember that they went through something bad. Uh, but but here's, here's really my main point about both kind of grief and stress, but also mental illness, it, it, which is that, you ask, but then you actually stand your ground, so to speak, and you listen. You're not, you're not distracted by your own embarrassment or, you know, if they, if they hesitate to say something because they're not, because people might hesitate to say because they're, because you might be like so many others. They say, how are things going? And then they don't listen and they walk away. Instead, what we Lutherans, maybe in particular, those of us who believe in the theology of the cross, that suffering is actually part of the Christian life, we don't, we don't fear suffering. We don't fear illness. We don't fear death. You know, the one thing that maybe we fear for some reason, back to stigma, is mental illness. But treat mental health problems like health problems. Just drop the word mental and realize this is just a health problem. This is just illness. You're not afraid of cancer. You're not afraid of heart disease. You're not afraid of, 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 of death. I mean, we don't seek it. We don't you know, look forward to it. Well, it makes us sad, but we know that Christ died for our sins and that our loved ones go to heaven after they die. And so, so you know, one of my favorite quotes from Luther is that he's writing someone about his father's death. And he said, I'm basically, I'm glad he's in heaven, but rarely have I felt so bad that rarely have I held death in such low esteem. He, held, he, he now doesn't think so much well of death as he used to. This is, this is the Lutheran. In. This is how, how Luther, Luther taught us to think and how we believe, which is death is just a passage into heaven and eternal life. We don't fear these things. There's nothing to fear about mental illness, mental health problems. Ask the person, how are you doing? And then take the time to actually listen. So part of that is don't ask unless you have the time to listen. Don't go up to someone whose mom just died and say, how are things going with you? Unless you do have five or 10 minutes to, to dedicate to listening. It's, it, I cannot emphasize enough that that the, you will do more for that person in five minutes just by gently and kindly asking 
and gently and patiently listening with kindness and compassion than I could do in a 50 minute session with them doing therapy. It will mean so much to them. You, everyone listening has so much power to help people. And I just want you to trust that what you're saying is helpful. Approaching them is helpful, but especially listening with compassion does so much good for people. Dr. Saunders, that is such excellent advice. And we only have about a minute left, but once someone has taken the time and they've listened, and if they're thinking, hmm, I suspect that there's perhaps something going on here that, that exceeds my listening, my compassionate listening, you know, walking with you, being your, your Christian brother or sister, um, what else can they do? What comes next? I mean, how, how is it that just like if someone were saying, boy, I've been having chest pains, we would say, have you thought about going Should to your medical doctor? <laughs> what would you do if you're thinking, hmm, I think someone has a mental problem or mental illness? Yeah, that, you know, that, that's a great question. I knew today was going to be rough when there's three smart people asking questions, but that's a, that's a really good, you know, the, 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 I think there's a two parts to that, which is that you normalize and say, wow, you know, I've, I've, I've had this. I think I know what you're going through. Don't say I know what you're going through because that can be, they might be going through such psychological, emotional pain that it's hard for anyone to know what they're going through. Don't say, I know what you're going through. Say, wow, you're going through a lot. I think I know what's my sister, my brother, my, my, my spouse, my mom, you know, or I myself have gone through something like this. Have you ever thought about talking to someone about it? You know, cause this is, it sounds, it sounds really bad and it's pretty common. So again, I know people who've gone through this or you say directly, what you're going through is really painful. Could you, would you ever think about talking to someone about this? Might even, if you're bold, say, would you go with me to pastor and let's, you know, if you know the person well enough, you might say this, let's, let's, why don't we go to pastor and, and let him know what's going on? Cause pastor is one step closer, so to speak, to a professional where they, they can get professional care. Not that pastor is going to provide the care necessarily, but that pastor might know better how to find a mental health professional. But have you ever thought about talking to someone about it? But then you'll be, should be, that is again, a question that you want to spend some time talking to the person about what does it mean to go see a mental health professional? Who are mental health professionals? What do they do? What, you know, what can they, how can they help and so forth? Listening with compassion, responding with compassion in that response, that sounds really challenging or I, that sounds like that, that's really difficult. Have you thought about talking to a professional? Can we pray with pastor? You know, would you come with me and we'll, we'll, we'll pray with pastor about this and then would you be open to talking about finding professional help? Yeah, great resources. We are all out of time for today. You can find Dr. Saunders' book, Martin Luther on Mental Health, Practical Advice for Christians today from Concordia Publishing House. Dr. Saunders, thanks for being our guest on The Coffee Hour. You're welcome. Thank you. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Tiffany Manor. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.